Good morning, everyone. It's a tremendous honor for me to participate in the Seoul Defense Dialogue, and I want to begin by thanking uh, the organizers, and particularly uh, the Ministry of National Defense, for the excellent arrangements. It's hard to imagine a more timely conference on the threats to security on the peninsula or a better team of experts to work on it. Uh, this is a first-class group lined up uh, for this panel, many of my close friends and longtime colleagues. Uh, so I'll begin, if I may, by introducing uh, first, first Vice Foreign Minister Im Sung Nam of Korea, uh, who is our presenter today. I think uh, in the absence of the Foreign Minister, you're actually probably the acting Foreign Minister, so welcome. Uh, he, while he's not on the stage, we'll welcome up uh, uh, to speak right after Vice Foreign Minister Lim is a colleague of mine, Marcus Garloskis, who's the National Intelligence Officer for North Korea in the United States, uh, to give a short level set on the situation. Uh, but next to Vice Minister Lim is Lieutenant General Thomas Bergson, U.S. Air Force the Deputy Commander of U.S. Forces Korea and the Combined Forces Command. Uh, to his left uh, is uh, Professor Jia Ching Kuo, the Dean of Peking University School of International Studies. And next to him is former Defense Minister of Japan Morimoto, now at Takshoku University in Japan. The next panelist is uh, Dr. Alexander Nikitin, who's the director of the Center for Euro-Atlantic Security in Moscow. And hopefully we can add Pacific to the Euro and to the Atlantic. And, uh, and lastly, uh, and with the last word at the panel, uh, someone you all know very well, uh, Vice Minister of National Defense, Su Chok So. Thank you very much. So my name is Danny Russell. I stepped down in late March after four years as the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs, uh, and after four years in the Obama administration in the White House in the NSC as uh, Senior Director. And I'm now a diplomat in residence at the Asia Society Policy Institute in uh, New York. So the game plan for this morning is to hear some concise remarks from the presenter and from the panelists, and then uh, aim to open the floor uh, to questions right away. So uh, I will turn the podium over to our first presenter, Vice Foreign Minister Lim, who is a close friend and a close colleague, one of the officials with the most credibility and the greatest respect uh, in Washington and in other capitals, and uh, with President Moon uh, and Foreign Minister Kong in Vladivostok today, and in the wake of the outrageous uh, North Korean six nuclear test, the missile flight over Japan, the UN Security Council's ongoing deliberations, the complexities in Korea's relations with China, with Japan, and at least according to Twitter, uh, some complications with the United States as well. Uh, I hope you'll share your thinking, Vice Foreign Minister, on what is to be done. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Danny Russell, my longtime friend, for his uh, uh, very generous introduction. And uh, I'd like to also welcome him to Korea uh, because uh, I have been working with him for so many years, perhaps uh, since the outbreak of the first nuclear crisis uh, uh, in, in the year 1993, uh, when he was uh, a political officer at the embassy in Seoul. I think uh, we have been working together uh, for so many years. And I also would like to welcome Jia uh, Qingguo Yuanjiang, uh, who has been a longtime friend of mine when I was working at the Korean Embassy in Beijing. 
I also would like to begin by extending my heartfelt congratulations to the Korean Ministry of National Defense and Vice Minister Seo Ju Seok for all the progresses Seoul Defense Dialogue has been making as a forum for the discussion of security issues in East Asia since its inception in the year 2012. I believe that the theme of uh, uh, this session, North Korea's nuclear and missile threats and security on the Korean Peninsula, could not come at a more opportune time because of the reasons we all know. Let me first begin by providing you with a quick snapshot of what has happened in the past several weeks. Following the two ballistic missile launches with the Intercontinental Range in July, which led to the adoption of the UN Security Council Resolution 2371, North Korea went on to shoot an IRBM over Japan toward the end of August. North Korea, however, did not stop there. Pyongyang sent shock waves across the globe with its sixth nuclear test last Sunday, claiming that the purpose of this testing is to develop nuclear warheads to be installed on top of its ICBMs. Through six nuclear tests since 2006, North Korea has rapidly advanced its nuclear capability. The explosive yield of the six nuclear test far exceeded the sum of all five previous tests. As confirmed by the CTBTO, Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, there has been a fundamental change in the magnitude and nature of North Korea's nuclear program, and this issue has reached a new level of gravity. Furthermore, after showing that its missiles are capable of reaching Guam last week, North Korea threatens to test fire its missiles farther toward the Pacific. To make a long story short, Pyongyang seems committed to diversifying its ballistic missile arsenal, including SLBMs, and proving its full-fledged ICBM capability. In response to all these threats and provocations, the international community, including every state represented on this panel, has strongly condemned Pyongyang's flagrant and irresponsible acts. In the wake of the sixth nuclear test, there has been an outpouring of strong disappointment and indignation around the world. As emphasized by President Moon Jae-in, immediately following the North Korean nuclear test last Sunday, Pyongyang has made an unacceptable strategic mistake. In response to these dangerous and destabilizing moves, the Korean government will do its utmost in close coordination with the international community so that every possible punitive measure can be taken. The entire international community will rally together to force North Korea to give up its nuclear and missile programs. Pyongyang must know that its wanton behavior will not go unchecked. Moreover, it should realize that nuclear and missile capabilities will not guarantee its security and economic survival. On the contrary, its nuclear and missile programs will only deepen its diplomatic isolation and economic hardships. Indeed, the international community 
has been sending a united and unequivocal message to Pyongyang that it must stop committing provocations. We have been witnessing an unprecedented level of awareness about North Korea's threat posed by its uh, rapidly advancing and ballistic missile programs. So far, 68 countries have an, and seven international organizations have joined in the global chorus of a strong condemnation against North Korea's provocations. In countering North Korea's continued provocations, the UN Security Council bears a special responsibility. The Security Council must respond to this serious provocation with the adoption of a new resolution containing much tougher measures corresponding to the magnitude and gravity of the test. Allegedly, the Security Council is discussing a new resolution in order to take meaningful and biting measures in such areas as banning the supply of oil and exportation of textiles and laborers. In this process, those neighbors of North Korea with considerable diplomatic and economic leverage over Pyongyang should be ready to do more through both words and deeds. Moreover, the Korea-US alliance has always been and will continue to be the cornerstone in deterring North Korea's further nuclear and missile provocations. The Republic of Korea and the US will take concrete actions to bolster our military deterrence and combine the joint defense posture. At the summit meeting held in Washington DC in June, the US reiterated its commitment to provide extended deterrence to the Republic of Korea, drawing on the full range of US military capabilities, both conventional and nuclear. To this end, President Moon and President Trump most recently agreed to remove the limit on the payload of the Korean missiles under the existing missile guideline. In particular, just like any other sovereign state in the world, the Republic of Korea government is fully committed to take all necessary measures to safeguard the security of the nation and the lives of its people. We will do all we can do to defend against threats from North Korea, conventional and unconventional. Some say that sanctions and deterrence will not be enough to bring North Korea to the negotiation table. As you know, our government, since its inauguration in May, has embraced a policy of denuclearization by pursuing sanctions and pressure on the one hand, and at the same time seeking dialogue on the other hand. However, Given North Korea's continuous provocations, now is not the right time for dialogue. Rather, it is time to tighten the screws on North Korea with a view to forcing the regime to change its strategic calculation. Let me make it clear. The ball is in Pyongyang's court. If Pyongyang makes the right choice, we stand ready to offer a brighter future and the window of a new opportunity can be open for them. Distinguished guests, last but not least, I'd like to share with you 
one English phrase I came to remember during my tenure in London as ambassador. Just as the British did in the face of possible invasion across the English Channel, the Korean government and people together with the international community will, quote, keep calm and carry on, unquote, for the eventual denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. I trust that the Seoul Defense Dialogue will provide us with valuable insights and wisdom for our future endeavors. I look forward to constructive discussion at this morning's session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vice Foreign Minister Lim, for that great outline. Uh, I know I and others will have uh, many questions for you further, but you really put your finger on the crux of the issue, which is uh, will sanctions and deterrence eventually bring North Korea to the table? Uh, in any event, uh, your strategy is to up the pressure and uh, tighten the screws, as you put it, uh, to bring Kim Jong-un to the point where uh, he really has no viable alternative but to negotiate. Now, the National Intelligence Officer for North Korea is a hugely important position in the U.S. government because uh, the person who occupies this role uh, is the person whose analysis and whose assessment of North Korea's strategy and North Korea's modus operandi is going to form the basis for decisions by U.S. national security policymakers. And Marcus Karloskis uh, is not only a close friend of mine, uh, we've logged many, many, many hours uh, together in the windowless uh, White House Situation Room, uh, <laughs> where I've heard him uh, brief national security advisors and, and senior officials. I am genuinely amazed that they allowed you, Marcus, to uh, briefly escape from the sit room, uh, but I see that as a testimony to the importance that uh, the Trump administration places both on its alliance with South Korea and with the, uh, the Seoul uh, defense dialogue. So uh, you've got a few minutes, Marcus, here to make sense of what uh, Kim Jong-un is up to. And while I know that in the U.S. the intelligence community doesn't uh, make policy prescriptions per se, if you've got enough time left over, we can make an exception for you. Uh, so feel free. Marcus Karlaskis. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Danny and the organizers uh, for this opportunity. And I also would like to, as you can imagine, thank the team uh, back at the Office of Director of National Intelligence uh, for supporting my participation uh, at such a busy time, and my team, of course, for uh, all the work that they have to do on my behalf uh, in my absence. Uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity um, to engage with you. And I do look, in fo look forward to hearing the, the panel's views uh, on North Korea. Uh, so before I begin, uh, just a brief disclaimer, I want to emphasize the following views that I'm going to share are my own, and they don't represent an official uh, U.S. government position uh, as I'm a serving intelligence officer. So it's great to be back in Seoul uh, and to see old friends and colleagues here. I spent 12 years here in the headquarters of United Nations Command uh, and the ROK U.S. Combined Forces Command. And one of the key takeaways from this experience that I want to share with you today is that a common and clear assessment of the threat is a foundation, a vital foundation, for unified strategy, plans, and actions. If international partners in an effort proceed from different uh, assessments and assumptions about the threat, they're going to have a very difficult time developing a common approach to deter and deal with that threat. So I'm going to begin my contribution here to this panel by trying to lay out a view of how the threats and challenges posed by North Korea have changed and as was noted this morning, are continuing to rapidly evolve. I'm going to focus on three key aspects uh, this morning in terms of regime leadership, uh, capabilities, and then a little bit about North Korea's uh, internal dynamics. So first, we must consider the change in the leadership of North Korea and its strategic implications. Now, Kim Jong-un is a potentially destabilizing factor from a strategic perspective. 
Since taking the helm of North Korea in December 2011, Kim has further solidified his position as the unitary leader and final decision authority in North Korea through purges, executions, and leadership shuffles. He also unveiled new ruling structures in conjunction with the uh, Korean Workers' Party Congress, the first held in a generation in May 2016. It's noteworthy that Kim has no clearly identified successor and seems inclined to prevent the emergence of a clear number two who could consolidate power in his absence. Now this means that the stability of the regime very well might hinge on Kim's personal status. This also means in a system of one man rule that you have implications for decision making and for controlling escalation. Now in terms of the regime leadership strategic incentives, or I should say intentions, you can see them displayed very clearly here on the slide. Kim and the regime have publicly emphasized and codified North Korea's focus on advancing its nuclear weapons program while developing the troubles country, to co the, uh, troubles country economy uh, in the uh, strategy referred to as Byungjin, or the parallel uh, policy. Now, as my boss, the Director of National Intelligence, has noted, Pyongyang's enshrinement uh, of the possession of nuclear weapons in its constitution, while repeatedly stating that nuclear weapons are necessary for the regime's survival, suggests that Kim does not intend to negotiate these weapons away at any price. Now, we've long assessed that Pyongyang's nuclear capabilities are intended for a variety of purposes, including deterrence, international prestige, and then, of course, as has been warned already today, coercive diplomacy. But meanwhile, we must also be mindful that North Korea's export of ballistic missiles and associated materials to several countries, notably including Iran and Syria, as well as its assistance to Syria's construction of a nuclear reactor, which was destroyed in 2007, illustrate North Korea's willingness to proliferate dangerous technologies. Now, we also must assess realistically how North Korean capabilities and the perception of those capabilities are rapidly evolving. North Korea has expanded the size and sophistication of its ballistic missile forces from close range ballistic missiles to ICBMs. North Korea's unprecedented level of testing and displays of strategic weapons in 2016 and continuing through into 2017 indicate that Kim is intent on proving that he has the capability to strike the U.S. mainland with nuclear weapons. Just the displays alone for the last two years, you can see here on the screen, have been unprecedented and should be quite troubling. Kim has been photographed beside a purported nuclear warhead design and thermonuclear warhead design with missile reentry vehicles intended to show that North Korea has warheads small enough to be delivered by missile. He's been shown examining a reentry vehicle nose cone after a simulated reentry, and he's been shown overseeing launches from a submarine and from mobile launchers in the field, purportedly simulating nuclear use in warfighting scenarios. Now, in terms of testing milestones, North Korea conducted an unprecedented number of launches in 2016 and 2017, including a 2016 space launch that put a satellite into orbit. Now, North Korea's most recent tests, which were also alluded to this morning, uh, including two intercontinental range ballistic missiles in July, a development that Director Coates warned in his annual threat assessment was coming, is one of the milestones that we have expected would help refine our timeline and our judgments on the threats that Kim Jong-un poses to the continental United States. Further, last week's intermediate range launch over Japan, in the wake of its threats to fire over Japan to near Guam, marks a new milestone in North Korea's missile testing and in its willingness to threaten and defy the international community. All of these ballistic missile tests probably helped to shorten North Korea's pathway toward achieving a reliable ICBM. Now, the regime also conducted three nuclear tests in the last two years, including last September's test that was claimed to be of a standard, nuclei, standard nuclearized warhead design, and then the most recent test on 3 September uh, claimed to be a thermonuclear ICBM warhead design. All of these tests and their impact on our assessments highlight the advancing threat that North Korea's nuclear and ballistic missile programs pose to the United States, to the region, and to the world. Now, in addition, at the April 15th parade marking the 75th anniversary of the North Korean People's Army, North Korea displayed a number of new missile systems, including two large canisters, which may have been intended to signal that North Korea is working toward the development of a solid propelled ICBM, in addition to shorter range solid fueled missiles. The parade also included tracked launchers, a development that may be aimed at increasing the mobility and survivability of the arsenal, considering North Korea's relatively high percentage of unpaved roads. 
Now, in addition to these developments, North Korea also possesses a substantial number of proven mobile ballistic missiles capable of striking a variety of targets in both Japan and in South Korea, as demonstrated in successful launches in 2016. North Korea has long posed a evolving and credible threat to South Korea and, of course, to a lesser extent, Japan. North Korea fields a large conventional forward deployed military that retains the capability to inflict serious damage despite significant resource shortfalls and aging hardware. This continues to provide North Korea with a conventional deterrent and with conventional military options as it further develops its nuclear capabilities. Now, Kim has further expanded the regime's conventional strike options in recent years with more realistic training, with artillery upgrades, and with new close-range ballistic missiles that enable precision fire at ranges that can reach more U.S. and allied targets in South Korea. North Korea also has other cap key capabilities beyond its WMD capabilities and its conventional forces. For example, Pyongyang has conducted cyber attacks against U.S. commercial entities, of course, most specifically Sony Pictures Entertainment, in 2014, and remains capable of launching disruptive or destructive cyber attacks to support its political objectives. Now lastly, I want to wrap up by highlighting that North Korea's society and economy, particularly the elite lifestyles and attitudes in North Korea, also appears to be changing. And we must consider this in our assessment going forward. Marketization is now a major economic force in North Korea. The rising generation in North Korea is mo more profit-driven, consumerist, materialistic, individualistic. And fueled by markets, information is now flowing into North Korea th more than ever before. Regime uh, no longer has a monopoly here. And then, more troubling, North Korea's ability to pursue its WMD programs is being underpinned by an adaptive network of individuals and businesses, many of whom quite wittingly are helping North Korea to evade sanctions for profit. So we as North Korea watchers must keep all these factors in mind as we consider the years and month ahead, months ahead and the effects of international pressure. We must be mindful that North Korea is adaptive, but also that change could come quickly and unexpectedly in North Korea. We should also consider the possibility of multiple contingencies going forward, one of which might lead to a catastrophic failure of deterrence in a crisis. As unpleasant as this prospect may be, may be and as unlikely as we hope it all is, we must be clear-eyed about the potential for miscalculation and how dangerous North Korea could prove to be in such a scenario. I hope this has provided you with a helpful foundation for a common perspective on the security threats posed by North Korea, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing this panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, you, you made a very important point at the outset, which is that uh, to forge a common approach among the affected nations, we have to have a common threat perception. I think you gave uh, a grim but uh, sobering look at North Korea's uh, capabilities. And I'd flag in particular one thing you referenced is the growing net business network uh, that flourishes uh, outside of North Korea and that facilitates not only the nuclear and the missile programs, but also potentially uh, proliferation further on. And that's something that I think we're all going to have to take a very close look at. Next, General Bergeson is the Deputy Commander of the Combined Forces Command, and he's got a lot of other distinguished titles as well. He's got responsibility and control over the one of the most powerful military forces on, the, on planet Earth. He's also got one of the toughest mandates to deter and defend, uh, to keep the peace, and to be ready to fight tonight. Uh, and for that, we thank you very much, General. And in just 10 minutes, I hope you'll share your perspective on the security situation in the peninsula. What, what are the most significant risks that you think we're facing? Uh, what are we doing to deter, to deter and to defend and to protect against them? What more can or should we be doing? And particularly in light of the Ulchi Freedom Guardian exercise and things like China's continued call on us to freeze our exercises to put Kim Jong-un in a, in a good mood. So maybe he will comply with international law. Uh, perhaps you could say a word or two about the very useful purpose that exercises serve and what it would mean to forego that as some sort of uh, vague goodwill gesture. So. Over to you, General. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Adi uh, Thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak at this uh, distinguished uh, panel. 
Um, and I'll try to answer some of those questions perhaps after my prepared remarks. Um, it did spur uh, a bunch of uh, ideas for me, so thank you so much. Uh, for, for six decades, the countries we represent have been dealing with the complex situation here on the peninsula. While we all agree that over those years our objectives and inter interests have at times diverged, we also must all agree that we benefit from a secure and stable condition on the Korean Peninsula, and we all have a vested interest in preventing a return to conflict. So let me touch on a couple of thoughts that may spur some dialogue. North Korea's weapons program represents a clear and grave threat to the national security of all of our nations. The North continues to defy international sanctions and norms by pursuing a ballistic missile program. So far in 2017, Kim Jong-un has fired a total of 21 missiles in 14 separate events. This is more than the total number of missiles fired during the reigns of both his father and grandfather combined. And this past weekend's nuclear test is but another in a long series of provocations and is a slap in the face to all of us. North Korea openly states that its ballistic missiles are intended to deliver nuclear weapon strikes to cities in the United States, the Republic of Korea, and Japan. That objective, of course, puts China and Russia well within range. Clearly, there are divergent interests among us all. But in the end, we all desire a non-belligerent, stable North Korea that conforms to international norms. So that's why I'm a proponent of dialogue among the five parties, so we can work together to deter North Korea from proceeding down their precipitous path. We do not want to bring KJU to his knees. We prefer to bring him to his senses, to convince him to choose not to continue his destructive behavior. This requires credible consequences for not choosing improved behavior. It's essential that the international community especially those nations represented here, act cohesively to ensure these consequences are weighty and convincing. A stable environment is a shared goal for all concerned. This requires us to keep a dialogue open to coordinate efforts across the diplomatic, military, and economic spheres. So I think I've gone less than 10 minutes and yield my time back to the panel. So in closing, I just want to say thank you for your continued interest and involvement in the security of this great nation and in the region. Kamsahamida. Thank you, Tom. Well, if I could steal a little of the time that you graciously returned to the panel, and perhaps you could uh, speak from your seat, uh, if that's okay. You were the Air Force Deputy Chief of Staff for Plans at the Pentagon. Uh, you know a thing or two about uh, of planning, and I wondered if you could just say a word about how the rapid pace of Kim Jong-un's ballistic missile uh, development program uh, impacts the planning that uh, the U.S. forces and the Combined Forces Command have for uh, defending against the threat from North Korea. Well, it's the first objective and responsibility, I think, of any good military officer is to present options to their national command authorities. And so it's our responsibility to stay ahead of that threat and to continually update our plans um, so that they're credible. Um, because at the heart of deterrence is that credibility. So you had mentioned the UFG earlier, uh, which is a defensive exercise, and it's important that to prevent miscalculations on the part of KJU, that he see uh, the alliance as a, pose a credible uh, defense in case he miscalculated and conducted any offensive operations. And part of those exercises is to continually update those plans, and so they do remain credible. Thank you. Great. Thank, great answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dean Jia Jingkuo of Peking University is one of China's most uh, respected uh, voices, and the fact that he's on the standing committee of the CPCC, I think, means that when Professor Jia talks, everybody listens, uh, not only in China, but uh, overseas. I certainly listen. And so I very much hope uh, he'll talk to us about Chinese perspectives on 
uh, the DPRK and on uh, the Korean Peninsula. And, and in particular, Professor Ja, I, I admit that I've been shocked at the extent to which Kim Jong-un's actions have put China's interest uh, and China's face at risk, that Kim Jong-un has shown really a shocking arrogance uh, and frankly insult towards China, especially China's leaders, by timing his nuclear test to coincide directly with the BRICS summit hosted by President Xi and Xiamen China, uh, the ICBM launch uh, time to coincide with President Xi's state visit to Moscow, and then the multiple uh, missile launches that he conducted right during the Belt and Road uh, Forum. You can't believe that this is happening uh, by, uh, by accident, and it suggests that Kim believes that there won't be any real retaliation uh, from China. So please tell me if I'm wrong in that assessment and uh, what steps you see China contemplating to deal with what in any case is, is a very serious threat to all of us. Well, thank you, Dan. Uh, and also I want to uh, thank uh, the organizers uh, to invite me here to uh, have this opportunity to speak. Uh, well, actually, I speak for myself. <laughs> I don't speak for my government. Uh, I'm a mere professor. Um, I think uh, to mo Chinese view of this situation is, pro is uh, diverse. You know, we have a lot of voices in China. You know. But personally, I think uh, more and more people think that North Korea's pursuit of nuclear weapons is posing an increasing threat uh, to the peace and stability of the region and the world. All, it's also posing an increasing threat to China's own security. So this time, uh, I think China joined uh, with other countries to condemn uh, North Korea's blatant violation of the UN Security Council resolution to conduct this, this uh, new massive nuclear test. The North Korean nuclear problem uh, is a South Korea's problem. It's also a US problem. Uh, I think it is also China's problem. Some people in China think that this is other people's problem. Uh, personally, I think it's also a China's problem. So China and other countries need to work together uh, to address this problem rather than separately. I think China and uh, other countries, including the US, South Korea, Russia, and Japan, share the goals of uh, denuclearization, stability and peace in the region, uh, on the peninsula especially, and dialogue and negotiation as the preferable means to address the problem. We may differ in tactics as to how to deal with the North Korea uh, nuclear threat. But we should never let our difference in tactics to blind us the, uh, the fact that we share uh, the same goals in addressing the North Korean nuclear problem. I think it's time for us to work together more closely uh, to deal with uh, the North Korean uh, nuclear threat more forcefully. Uh, you know, we are going to talk about uh, a new round of tougher sanctions. Uh, you know, we may have differences, but we are going to have a new round of tougher sanctions. And uh, uh, 
I, we, we hope that uh, the North, North Korea uh, leaders would listen, uh, would feel the pressure, would see the light uh, to change its uh, current practice. I think the current practice on the part of North Korea is suicidal. Uh, it threatens to uh, bring great damages to other countries, but uh, it also threatens uh, its own uh, survival. So I hope that the leaders of North Korea would, would uh, uh, see this uh, eventually. In addition to increasing sanctions, I think we should start dialogues uh, among ourselves between uh, China and the United States, between China and South Korea, maybe between the US and South Korea, and, and, and also China, US, and South Korea, and the five members of the six party talks on contingency plans. I think it's time for us to think about contingency situations. We cannot afford to make hasty decisions during crisis without prior consultation. I think it's time uh, for us to do that. Not uh, that we need, we, we will fight tomorrow, but we need to get ready. Nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, so it's better to have a, a dialogue on the contingency plans uh, sooner than later. And also the dialogue should also talk about the future. I mean, the post-crisis arrangement. Are we going to, uh, what kind of a, uh, process. Uh, how, how to how how can we restore order? Uh, and who should restore order in North Korea if there is a crisis? How should we secure the nuclear weapons to make sure that they are not being used? And also, what kind of a post-crisis order uh, that should be established in the in the Korean Peninsula? Should we have a UN-sponsored peninsula-wide plebiscite to decide on a united, uh, the establishment of a united uh, Korea? Yeah. So all these things we need to talk about. And also the fast system. Okay. Should it be removed uh, immediately if the, from the peninsula if the North Korean nuclear issue is, is, is resolved? So we need to talk about all these things, uh, uh, both uh, as a way to reassure ourselves and protect our interests, and also uh, as a way to persuade North Korea uh, what kind of uh, alternative it is facing. Finally, I think we should uh, also uh, need to uh, talk to North Korea one way or the other. Not to accommodate its wishes, but to, again, let it know that uh, what lies ahead, if it continues with this uh, current practice, and there are better, and also there are better alternatives open to them if they give up the current approach to nuclear weapons. Okay. We should at any time give peace a chance uh, as much as we can. Okay. So these are my thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Zhao. Very, very thoughtful, very insightful, uh, I think very wise. Uh, despite any tactical differences, uh, you said, we share the same goals. Uh, a new round of sanctions is coming, and it's important for the North Korean leader to, to feel pressure. 
And I think very importantly, uh, you raise the tremendous value in uh, preparing for a crisis so that in a moment of great turmoil and stress on the Korean Peninsula, we're not only in the early stages of trying to figure out what each other thinks and what each other uh, might do. So uh, I'd like to hear more from you on that front. But uh, before we do, let me turn to former Defense Minister uh, Morimoto of Japan, who is a, a good and an old friend to so many of us and has long been a bipartisan advocate for increasing Japan's ability to make real and meaningful contributions to peace and, and security in a responsible way. And uh, Morimoto Sensei, particularly given the threatening demonstration of the North Korean IRBM that overflew uh, Japan last month, uh, we'd be interested in hearing from you what sorts of uh, steps uh, you think the Abe government uh, is or should be considering. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Russell. Uh, it's a great honor to be invited and here to make my remarks before the very distinguished uh, participant in this conference room. My name is Satoshi Morimoto. I am a former defense minister and now I'm working for the special policy advisor to the defense minister as well. Uh, quite frankly, I wrote uh, down my papers and sent uh, Secretary Yard almost two weeks ago for distribution. However, uh, most of the content of my paper became uh, very obsolete <laughs> due to the recent uh, several development of North Korea for the last two weeks. So uh, please delete my paper and listen to my remarks carefully on behalf of my paper. As you know very well, the last Sunday on uh, September 3rd, North Korea has uh, pushed ahead with a sixth round of nuclear tests. Uh, according to the analysis of uh, CTBTO, uh, the magnitude 6.0, and uh, we speculate the maximum yield of detonation is 160 kiloton. It's almost eight to 10 times detonations compared with Hiroshima atomic bomb of 15 kiloton, Nagasaki atomic bomb of 21 kiloton. It was successful uh, the detonation of hydrogen bomb, hydrogen bomb to be mounted to the ICBM, according to the North Korea announcement. The scale of yield of detonation was, as I said, 160 kiloton, the largest ever, almost 15 times of the size of previous uh, nuclear test of last year, which was 11 to 12 kiloton. Uh, Prime Minister Abe on that day strongly condemned North Korea uh, latest nuclear test as totally unacceptable for my country. Prime Minister also said that North Korea nuclear missile development has reached a new stage of threat to Japan's uh, security with even more severity and urgency. Prime Minister also said Japan will consider the stronger pressure response, including a further measure at the United Nations Security Council in order to encourage the North Korea to change its policies. Now, as you know, stage is setting uh, United Nations Security Council. We expect new uh, resolution include full scale of freeze of any kind of trade, and also ban of North Korea laborers who are sent overseas for labor working, and also freeze or ban of illegal money trade through banking network of another country, especially in Asia, using IT technology. The most critical issue is crude oil supply from China to 
North Korea, which is amount almost a half million ton every year. We know that Russia is selling oil to the North Korea, which is almost 3 to 4 percent of total quantity. Even if oil supply cannot freeze completely, some amount of oil supply could be restrained. It will give a significant effort, uh, effect not to not only uh, development program of nuclear and missile, but also uh, industry, transportation, and social life in North Korea. Key issue, whether key issues is whether China and Russia will agree these kind of sanction against North Korea or not. In a context of political stability of Kim Jong-un regime and national security interests of both countries. I speculate United States already have been uh, getting in touch with China uh, on this resolution. But however, US-Russia network is not necessarily settled. But therefore, Prime Minister Abe intend to persuade President Putin to agree this kind of sanction when uh, both head of, uh, say, joining Far East Economic Forum of that radio stock uh, from yesterday. Uh, we share the role of persuasion to China and Russia between US and Japan. The main objective of North Korea nuclear bar and ballistic missile development may be to intimidate the United States by demonstrating its nuclear deterrence capability to attack any place at US territory. Uh, North Korea speculates that uh, this would force the United States to recognize nuclear as a nuclear power. But so far, nuclear at uh, North Korea does not seem to have any attention to dismantle or freeze these project and enter into the dialogue and compromise or deal with any other country or uh, uh, international organization except United uh, States. Until G's aim or objective are uh, reached. Uh, so far, U.S. also uh, has no intention to open the dialogue at all with North Korea due to the bad experience in the a, in a, in a past. A strong determination not to accept uh, the North Korea as nuclear power and taking a stance that it will not tolerate North Korea having a capability to attack the United States with nuclear weapon. Pentagon does not rule out any military option in line with its policy of maintaining all possible options in dealing with the North Korea's nuclear missile development. Japan support U.S. has any option, including military measure, on the table. But however, we have to understand the Mr. Mattis, Defense Secretary of the United States, indicated the military solution will cause tragic result. North Korea should be aware that if it push ahead with its nuclear and missile development programs, it will invite U.S. military attack, and this may lead to the destruction of Kim Jong regime. In this context, I agree with Chinese uh, participant remarks. Mr. Mattis of Pentagon. Uh, made the remarks at a news conference in the White House on the third of this, this month. We have many military options, and the president wanted to brief on each of them. News media clarified that uh, this option is total uh, 12 options. I don't know exactly uh, yet, but also uh, he said uh, we have made that we have ability to defend ourselves and our allies, South Korea and Japan, from any attack. 
Kim Jong-un should take heed. The United Nations Security Council's uh, unified voice, all members unanimously agree on the threat North Korea pose, and they remain unanimous in their commitment to be denuclearization of Korean Peninsula because we are not looking to total annihilation of North Korea. This is his remarks. Then I would like to explain and point out some major uh, uh, point of, of Japan's security policy on this matter. Why is that Japan cannot accept North Korea serious intolerable, intolerable provocation which violate international law and increasingly oppose new level of threat uh, of a grave nature to international peace and stability and non-proliferation. That is the first one. Second, Japan intend to make close coordination with United States and the Republic of Korea to work out for solution that would implement further stronger sanction and pressure against North Korea. New Security Council resolution has to attempt to cut off the supply fund for North Korea's nuclear and missile development by imposing sanction on a third country enterprise, including a Chinese company doing business with North Korea. Also, key factor of the resolution is whether and how much the China can limit the crude oil supply to the North Korea and how the China take a consideration of destabilizing North Korea regime or not. Our country has been promoting and deploying the most effective missile defense system to destroy incoming uh, nuclear equipped ballistic missile so far Japan deployed the easy ships with standard missile through Block 1A and also additional four easy ships with standard missile Block 2A in the future at mid cost. And also a Patriot Pack 3 uh, MAC missile segment enforcement of six battalion at the terminal phase. Our country is now reviewing additional missile defense system, including a deployment of easy Ashura to meet more effectively efficiently to engage incoming ballistic missile. Our country is making a best effort for alliance coordination with the United States in terms of Japan's uh, defense equipment technology, joint plan exercise, host nation support, and political or economic contribution to maintain the U.S. Uh, forces, Japan especially stationing on Okinawa and construction of uh, Guam uh, facility. In order to uh, uh, deterrence capability, we uh, uh, in, intend to procure the many kinds of equipment from uh, United States uh, under this fiscal year and the next fiscal year. Japan believes the U.S. extended nuclear deterrence uh, covered uh, Japan uh, uh, security very effectively. But uh, anyway, uh, Japan intend to continue to sustain significant contribution to support U.S. presence and operation in the region. Also, Japan, U.S. ROK shared information about ballistic missile uh, under uh, TISA, uh, Trilateral Information Sharing Agreement. And also, Japan and ROK maintain the GSOMIA to share and protect the information uh, each other. There are significant contribution to manage North Korea threat. Japan also a role to make logistical support to uh, allied uh, country in a contingency at a periphery, as the Chinese participant indicated, based on the peace and the security legislation, which uh, was approved by Diet in uh, 2015. On, on the conclusion, our country intend to give a strategic pressure through diplomatic effort, economic sanction, in order to encourage for North Korea to change its policy. At the same time, Japan intends to support U.S. policy with close coordination of 
uh, Republic of Korea, whatever United States will take auction as much as possible. We hope North Korea would realize and understand what kind of situation the North Korea stands on at present. How much seriously other nations, especially neighbors, has a serious concern on the current security environment and expect peaceful solution without any uh, military measure to overthrow North Korea regime. So uh, in this sense, I uh, absolutely uh, agree with the dialogue uh, on uh, that uh, perspective uh, with uh, Chinese participants. Thank you very much, Mr. Rasei. Thank you very much, uh, Morimoto Sensei, uh, for your comprehensive remarks. Uh, you talked a number of times about uh, both the importance of uh, cooperation between Japan and Korea, Japan, Korea, and the United States, trilateral cooperation. That's a subject uh, we should definitely come back to. Uh, and also about missile defense and the steps that Japan is taking uh, to strengthen its own uh, ability to contribute, which is a subject I'm sure that the audience is very interested in. Uh, next, we'll hear from Dr. Nikitin from Moscow State Institute of International Relations. I'm delighted that he was able to join us today. I noticed that early in his career, he served at his nation's mission to the United Nations, and he's done extensive research on nuclear nonproliferation and on uh, nuclear doctrine. Uh, so Dr. Nikitin, I'm sure you'd agree that Kim Jong-un's relentless pursuit of uh, nuclear capability and the means to deliver it, including through ICBM and maybe someday even through MIRV uh, capabilities, represents a very direct threat to uh, the NPT, and that's the NPT is a system that the former Soviet Union, now Russia has a strong stake, uh, did so much to help uh, develop. Uh, so we're very interested in, in your thinking about how to stop North Korea from unraveling the global nonproliferation system. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate if the slides would be projected onto the screen, and that's my request to computer engineers. Thanks. Esteemed participants of the security dialogue, uh, some ministers and officials speak here on behalf of their nations or institutions, but experts and analysts like myself, they speak on their own behalf and expect that uh, positions expressed would be attributed only to the expert. Having said that, let me throw in my first point. The time has come to stop the demand immediate denuclearization of the PRK, which is anyway improbable and start realistic talks over verifiable, and let me stress, verifiable arms control measures between the PRK and the West, combined West, including USA, South Korea, many other nations, uh, with some security guarantees for the PRK regime. Let me explain what I mean here. USA and South Korea designed a tailored deterrence strategy against North Korean nuclear threat already in uh, 2013. And since last year, the Extended Deterrence Strategic Consultation Group works, uh, including USA and Republic of Korea military. In fact, uh, the combined strategy of USA and uh, Republic of Korea in the sphere of deterring North Korean strike uh, is trilateral. First, uh, to deter by showing the force, uh, and deter means prevent the use of force by North Korea. But if deterrence fails, then reliable interception of Korean missiles, and then a retaliatory strike. South Korea aims at retaliation with conventional forces, and uh, Korea massive punishment and retaliation plan uh, before it was announced that it will be ready by 2020s, but I'm afraid now uh, Korean military are rushing to do it much earlier. Uh, North Korea celebrated the sixth military test and its um, capabilities advanced. First of all, uh, now uh, the North Korean missiles are solid fueled. They are mobile, they are maneuvering, and it's much more difficult to intercept them by uh, simple military measures. 
Now North Korea tried submarine-launched ballistic missile, which makes more difficult the tracing of the potential location of the strike. Uh, by the way, let me stress that uh, the conclusion that uh, North Koreans miniaturized the uh, nuclear devices uh, is under question mark. For us, for Russians, it took approximately several dozen of nuclear tests back in the 50s to proceed from the laboratory nuclear device to the reliable warhead. We doubt that in six tests you can do this. Now, though, technology is now is much more advanced. Uh, still, South Korean own ballistic missile defense efforts include the substitution of American-made Pac-2 with Pac-3s, and this process goes until 2020s. And uh, South Korea purchased from Israel and fielded two Green Pain Raiders and developed its own interceptors. In uh, this year, USA deployed the components of the THAAD system to South Korea. By the way, now USA wants South Korea to fully pay for this protection. And uh, yes, um, we understand that the interception uh, should be uh, oriented towards intercepting potential uh, strikes against the American defense bases, uh, military bases on Okinawa, on Guam, as well as taking into consideration the new missile capabilities, also to defend against intercontinental strikes. And it looks at first glance that the third system installed by Americans has very good range of uh, detection of the strike. It practically covers all Northeast Asia. But the range of interception is much, much smaller. In fact, uh, for Pac-2 and 3, it's only 25, 35 kilometers. For LSAM, it's about uh, 150 kilometers. For uh, most modern THAAD systems is about 200 kilometers, which means that decision making should be done in minutes, even in seconds after the potential strike. You don't have time for political negotiations, for discussions. You need either intercept now or never. And uh, look, for example, at this time frame, which is announced by South Korean side. It says that the kill chain uh, plan supposes that detection will be done in one minute, identification in another one minute, then political decision will be taken in three minutes, and the retaliatory strike from South Korea will be undertaken in 25 minutes. Very optimistic, very optimistic uh, estimation. Uh, in uh, recent year, President Trump demonstrates uh, toughness against Syria and North Korea. You remember 59 cruise missiles which were uh, striked against uh, Syrian territory. Uh, by the way, in both cases, in case of Syria and in case of North Korea, uh, the political task of toughness demonstrated by the American side is uh, very much oriented inside United States towards the electorate, towards the domestic audience. Uh, for example, when the 59 missiles were striked against Syria, Russia got uh, warning in three hours in advance to remove its uh, military forces from the area of potential strike. And yes, the strike looked very impressive, but uh, no technical harm. And here in interaction with North Korea, I'm afraid also part of the steps done by American side is a little bit motivated by the necessity to demonstrate domestic toughness toward the potential strike, and not always by the uh, technical willingness to resolve the issue. In fact, um, America has more than one option in interacting with the other countries through the uh, nuclear sphere. Uh, there is a nuclear cooperation with political allies like UK, France, and NATO. There is a mutual deterrence against Russia and China. There is a nuclear refinable arms control agreement, and they are also part of the political strategy. There is anti-ballistic missile defense as additional and not guaranteed protection, compensating and not fully compensating small third party nuclear capabilities, actual capabilities of the PRK or potential capabilities of Iran. And finally, there is a cooperative nuclear policy of Americans, a pragmatic share of some technologies measures against further proliferation towards partners like Israel, India, and Pakistan. So the spectrum is quite high. And uh, uh, there is a time to try arms control policy between the USA and North Korea. And uh, it will mean technical and political compromises, like no forward nuclear basin in South Korea of American uh, nuclear means, no naval basin in proximity, 
no provoke in U.S. South Korean military exercises, temporary political guarantees of survival for regime. What do we get in exchange? Hopefully in exchange, uh, if not the nuclearization, then the freezing of further development of North Korean nuclear program. Russia and the U.S. interest uh, on North Korea nuclear crisis diverged already years ago. Of course, Russia, the same as USA, does not want to see another nuclear power like North Korea needs its borders. But in contrast to the U.S., Russia does not support external regime change in the PRK as a goal. Russia's economic interests in North Korea are quite limited. Railroad projects, electricity supply, Russia accepts about 30,000 labor migrants from the PRK, and that brings 119 million U.S. dollars per year to North Korea after South Korea closed in 2016 Joint Industrial Park Kasun and 54,000 of North Korean workers lost jobs. But uh, this is not a big interface. In principle, Russia would prefer reincarnation of six-party talks and among other tasks, this format of talks re-emphasizes the role of Russia as a global power. But we realistically understand that six-party tours were a good start, but the table is empty since 2009, and practically this format seems to be dead by now. We need another format, another format of probably direct negotiations between the USA and North Korea. And here we have divergent goals of different participants of the potential talks. Uh, Western goal is denuclearization of the PRK, but behind it there is a second goal which is not always pronounced, and this is preferably regime change in Korea. And methodologically, it's very important if North Koreans denuclearize, is the West ready to guarantee not to touch the regime, the survival of regime? Because for North Koreans, the goal is exactly not to make a harm to other nations. The goal is to guarantee regime survival. They are attentively looking at uh, how the regime of Saddam Hussein was removed in 2003 in Iraq, the regime of Gaddafi in Libya, the regime of Talibs in Afghanistan. They realistically understand that they are next in the row if the deterrence by nuclear capabilities would evaporate. South Korean goal is the nuclearization of the PRK and reunification of Korean nation with no rush on the conditions of the South. We fully respect this goal. Russian goal is the nuclearization of the PRK or arms control with the PRK and uh, the stability of two systems of North South uh, Korea's with avoidance of uh, forceful imposed from outside regime change. We all, as international community, were a little bit overcharged the negotiations with North Koreans uh, with linkages. Uh, we uh, expose the regime change demand, also massive sanctions aimed at leader, but only leading to people's starvation. And uh, we imposed an uh, additional requirement that uh, DPRK should immediately enter the chemical weapons convention regime to avoid not only nuclear but chemical strike. Uh, we imposed uh, that necess necessary regulations are required in the space exploration to limit the uh, missile program of the North Korea. Thus, the list of demands is a little bit too wide. What are the realistic prospects? First of all, let's realistically understand that uh, the regime uh, would be preserved for indefinite period, maybe for decades. And Iran deal analogy like zero sanctions for zero weapons uh, is very improbable. What is realistic is a kind of Indian nuclear deal analogy when external control of marginal aspects of nuclear program could be undertaken without intrusion into separated military nukes program of North Korea. Yes, uh, this was done by Americans towards India. This could be done towards North Korea as well. A verifiable nuclear regime is needed and limited external monitoring by International Atomic Energy Agency could be um, realistically started. Uh, then a slow diffuse of sanctions uh, and of diplomatic isolation of North Korea, involvement of the PRK into international family of nations and influencing slowly from within as a main instrument for stabilization. And thus, let me wrap it up on the point from which I started. There is a time to stop demand immediate denuclearization, which is anyway improbable, and start realistic talks over arms control measures between the PRK and the West with some security guarantees for the PRK regime. Military option must be ruled out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nikitin. Uh, it's certainly a controversial proposition to suggest that uh, even though you're not speaking officially, that uh, the Russian Federation or others would abandon the uh, long-held objective of denuclearization and instead be willing to 
uh, essentially uh, bid the NPP farewell and accept North Korea as a nuclear state, focusing instead on negotiations, arms control negotiations, as you put it, that uh, vap uh, vacates the UN Security Council resolutions uh, that accepts North Korea uh, nuclear status, but simply hopes to negotiate some sort of uh, mechanism to tamp down on their provocative uh, behavior. I think uh, there's a lot of, uh, of food for uh, discussion there. Now, Vice Foreign Minister, Vice Defense Minister So has very deep experience in government uh, and in inter-Korean affairs, having served in the Nomuhyun administration as presidential secretary for unification and security. It was uh, Vice Defense Minister So who back in July proposed to the North that military talks could resume at Panmunjom as a practical way of coming to grips with some of the serious concerns on, on both sides. Minister, uh, you're the last speaker before we go to questions, so uh, I hope that building on what uh, first Vice Foreign Minister Lim said in his presentation, uh, you'll be able to give us some additional insights into the Moon administration strategy for dealing with the serious challenge that we all face. Thank you very much. Yeah, 반갑습니다. 아, 방금 소개받은 에, 서주석입니다. 에, 오늘 임성남 차관님께서 좋은 발제를 해주셨고 아, 여러 토론자님께서 에, 에, 다양한 의견을 제시해 주셨습니다. 에, 사실 임성남 차관님은 아, 저랑도 인연이 상당히 많습니다. 에, 한 10년 전에 아, 한국 청와대 NSC에서 같이 근무를 했었고요. 아, 지금은 에, 외교부 국방부의 이제 같은 차관 카운터 파트로서 그 NSC 그 실무 회의의 멤버이기도 합니다. 에, 그 자리에서 제가 이제 부탁을 드렸는데 이렇게 발제를 좋은 발제를 해주셔서 고맙습니다. 임성남 차관님께서는 북핵 문제의 심각성과 우리 정부와 국제사회가 추진해왔고 또 앞으로 추진해 나갈 방향을 아주 잘 설명해 주셨다고 생각합니다. 또 함께 토론해 주신 여러분들도 북한의 핵미사일 문제가 야기한 여러 가지 어려운 상황들에 대해서 깊은 관심을 가지고 의견을 주셨습니다. 특히 제재와 압박을 강화 하기 위한 국제적인 공조의 필요성을 아주 잘 말씀해 주셨다고 봅니다. 북한의 핵미사일 문제는 더 이상 방치할 수 없는 사안으로 남북뿐 아니라 국제사회의 문제라는 점에서는 이견이 없습니다. 북핵 문제 해결을 위한 국제사회의 일치되고 단합된 노력이 무엇보다 중요하다고 생각합니다. 돌이켜 보면 북한 북한 핵 문제는 지난 20년간 20여 년간 부침을 반복해 왔습니다. 특히 최근 수년간 북한은 핵 미사일 능력을 급속도로 고도화 시켜 왔습니다. 잘 아시는 바와 같이 북한은 여러 차례 재처리를 통해서 이미 50여 킬로그램의 플루토늄을 생산해서 확보하고 있고요. 아, 특히 2010년도에 처음 보여준 고농축 우라늄 프로그램으로 아, 상당한 양의 이, 그 우라늄을 고농축 우라늄 무기급 우라늄을 생산하고 있는 것으로 평가되고 있습니다. 또 지난 9월 3일 북한이 감행한 6차 핵실험은 저, 우리 한국의 에, 측정으로는 판단으로는 약 50 킬로톤 위력으로 봅니다. 에, 대한민국 지상청의 측정과 또 CTBTO 계산식에 따른 것입니다. 어, 여러 가지 이 평가에 대해서 이론이 좀 있습니다만, 6차 핵 실험은 
과거 다섯 차례의 핵실험보다 현저히 증대된 것이고 어, 그런 면에서 우리가 보다 강력한 대응이 필요하다고 봅니다. 북한은 탄도미사일 발사를 어, 최근 들어서 더욱 가속하고 있습니다. 올해 한 해만도 북한은 에, 탄도미사일을 14차례, 13차례 발사했고요. 미국 본토에 도달할 수 있는 대륙간 탄도미사일 개발에 박차를 가하고 있습니다. 북한은 지난 7월 이후에 화성 12형 중, 중거리 미사일 이어서, 미사일에 이어서 ICBM급의 화성 14형 미사일을 발사했습니다. 북한의 ICBM급 미사일은 사거리는 대륙간 탄도 탄에 준합니다만 저희가 보기에는 재진입 능력이 확인되지 않은 그런 제한된 미사일로 판단하고 있습니다. 또 며칠 전에 6차 핵실험 당일 오전에는 북한은 화성 14형 탄두에 탑재할 수 있는 수소탄이라고 주장하면서 그 모형을 공개한 바 있습니다. 잘 아시다시피 북한에게 핵무기는 체제 유지를 위한 생존 수단인가 동시에 강력한 한미동맹에 대한 대응 수단입니다. 북한은 국제사회의 반대와 제재에도 불구하고 핵능력 고도화를 통해서 대외적으로 핵 보유국의 지위를 확보하고 미북관계 정상화를 통해서 체제 생존을 보장받으려고 하는 것으로 저희는 판단하고 있습니다. 따라서 북한은 앞으로도 핵실험과 미사일 발사를 계속함으로써 핵무기를 탑재한 ICBM 능력을 갖추기 위한 노력을 끊임없이 진행할 것으로 보입니다. 여러분들이 주로 외교적인 해법에 대해서 말씀하셨습니다만 저는 우리 국방부의 국방 차원의 대응 조치와 비전에 대해서 말씀드리겠습니다. 대한민국 국방부는 점증하는 북한의 핵미사일 위협에 대해서 두 가지 방향으로 대응 정책을 추진하고 있습니다. 첫째는 현실화하고 있는 북한의 위협을 억제하고 대응할 수 있는 능력과 태세를 조기에 갖추는 것입니다. 두, 둘째는 아, 정부의 대북 정책을 힘으로 뒷받침한 가운데 남북 간의 군사적인 긴장 완화를 위한 노력을 어, 경주하는 것입니다. 먼저 북한 위협에 대한 단호한 대응이 저희한테 우선적으로 요구되는 과업이라고 할수 있습니다. 북한 위협에 대한 단호한 거부는 우리 문재인 대통령께서도 여러 차례 언급하셨고 우리 국방부나 또는 한미 간의 협의 차원에서 여러 차례 언급됐습니다. 한미는 지난주 국방장관 회담에서 미국의 강력한 확장 억제 공약을 포함해서 철통 같은 안보 공약을 재확인했고 북한의 그 어떠한 공격도 효과적이고 압도적인 대응에 직면하게 될 것이라는 점을 강조했습니다. 아신 바와 같이 한미동맹은 북한의 전략적 도발로 인한 한반도 위기가 고조됐을 때 미국의 전략 자산을 한반도에 전개해 왔습니다. 올해에도 장거리 전략 폭격기, 스텔스 전투기, 항모 전단 등이 전개된 바가 있습니다. 앞으로 또 한미 동맹은 주기적인 한미 연합 연습과 다양한 수준의 국방 협의를 통해서 연합 방위 태세를 지속적으로 강화해 나갈 것입니다. 
한미동맹 차원의 조치와 함께 우리 군의 독자적인 대응 능력도 계속해서 확충해 나갈 것입니다. 니키틴 박사님께서 우리 군의 그 군사적 조치에 대해서 상세한 말씀도 해주셨습니다만 북한이 미사일을 발사하기 전에 미리 탐지해서 타격하는 힐체인 능력 또 북한이 발사한 미사일을 단계적으로 유혹하는 한국형 미사일 방어체계 KAMD를 조기에 갖추는 그런 방향이 적극 추진되고 있습니다. 또 북한이 핵무기로 위해를 가할 경우에 대비해서 북한 전쟁 지도본부를 포함한 주의부를 직접 겨냥하는 대량, 대량 응집 보복 개념도 발전시켜 나가고 있습니다. 이번에 한미 간에 한국의 미사일 탄두 중량 해제에 합의한 것도 이와 관련해서 의미 있는 것이라고 평가됩니다. 이러한 조치들은 북한의 점증하는 핵미사일 위협에 대비하기 위한 군사적 차원의 조치입니다. 북한의 핵을 인정하거나 기정사실화하는 것이 아닙니다. 또한 북한이 주장해온 바와 같이 이른바 북한에 대한 적대시 정책의 일환으로 추진되는 것이 아니고 오히려 현존하거나 또는 예상되는 위협에 대비하는 차원의 군사적 대응 조치라는 점을 강조하고 싶습니다. 대한민국 국방부는 북한의 위협에 대응하기 위한 조치와 함께 한반도에서 군사적 긴장을 완화하기 위한 노력도 적극적으로 병행해 나갈 것입니다. 문재인 대통령께서는 지난 7월 6일 신베를린 구상을 통해서 우리 정부가 추구하는 목표가 평화로운 한반도라는 점을 분명히 밝힌 바 있습니다. 국방부는 지난 7월 하순에 군사분계선에서 군사적 긴장을 고조시키는 일체의 적대 행위를 중지하고 남북 간의 긴장을 완화하는 문제를 논의하기 위한 남북군사당국회담을 공개적으로 북한에 제안한 바 있습니다. 이제 마지막입니다. 평화로운 한반도를 위해서는 한반도를 넘어 동북아와 세계 평화에 위협이 되는 북한 핵미사일 문제가 조속히 해결되어야 합니다. 제재와 대화 등 모든 수단을 통해 북한의 비핵화를 이끌어내는 것은 선택이 아닌 우리 모두의 과업이라고 할수 있습니다. 시기와 단계에 따라서 제재와 대화 중에 경중이 있을 수 있습니다. 그리고 지금은 물론 제재와 압박에 집중할 때라고 봅니다. 그러나 장기적인 어떤 북한 핵 문제 해결을 위해서 결국은 이 모든 수단의 활용이 무엇보다 중요한, 중요하다는 점을 다시 한번 강조드리고 싶습니다. 예, 고맙습니다. Thank you very much, Vice Minister s a for that comprehensive uh, inventory. And I'd uh, like to go to questions and take the prerogative of starting, uh, picking up, um, Vice Minister, uh, where you left off, which is to ask uh, some of our panelists to talk a little bit about deterrence. Because as an alliance, uh, the U.S. and the ROK, and of course uh, on a trilateral basis with Japan, has some pretty amazing capabilities. Uh, there's been some discussion of THAAD, PAC-3, Aegis, uh, but also something that General Bergson knows quite a bit about, F-22s, F-35s, uh, B-1, B-2 bombers, Global Hawk, uh, carrier strike groups, uh, nuclear submarines. Uh, we've got a tremendous technological edge, uh, but at the same time there is considerable talk in South Korea about ideas such as the reintroduction of tactical nuclear weapons which were withdrawn uh, by President Bush 41 after uh, the end of the Cold War. 
there's a considerable effort afoot in Japan to explore the possibility of developing uh, new strike uh, capabilities. Is this the direction that we should be going in? And as the North Korean uh, threat grows, uh, what should the U.S., what should the Allies, what should the international uh, community be doing in order to uh, strengthen our uh, deterrence? And well, it's, it's because it's not exclusively a military question, let me take the liberty of beginning with uh, Vice Foreign Minister Im, who's done so much particularly to promote uh, trilateral coordination among the three countries. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Danny, uh, for uh, very important um, questions and points. Uh, number one, uh, with regard to the idea of uh, uh, introducing uh, tactical nuclear weapons uh, into the Korean Peninsula again, uh, I think uh, that kind of uh, sentiment, all those voices we hear inside Korea recently in support of uh, that idea truly reflects the frustration and the anger of the Korean people at what's happening in the northern half of the Korean Peninsula in the past week. Um, but at the same time, as emphasized by my government consistently, the Korean government is fully committed to the uh, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And right now, there is no change whatsoever in that position. Uh, with regard to the uh, trilateral cooperation you just uh, talked about, we believe the trilateral cooperation among Korea, Japan, and the U.S. is a very important tool once again for deterrence against the possible military provocation from the North. But having said that, I very much agree with the personal idea presented by Professor Jia ching Guo, emphasizing the need for the trilateral con con consultation, another trilateral consultation among Korea, China, and the U.S. Uh, which all shared one single important problem, which is a North Korean nuclear issue. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, General Bergson, anything that you'd care to add on the subject of deterrence? Uh, just briefly, I would say that the, uh, that the U.S. does not support the reintroduction of tactical nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula, although we certainly understand you know, those feelings, especially in light of the recent nuclear test. But uh, you know, the U.S. provides strategic uh, security guarantees, a nuclear umbrella, if you will, um, to defend its allies, uh, Japan and, and the Republic of Korea. And we think that's probably sufficient. Great. Dr. Nikita. On the subject of deterrence, in fact, situation of deterrence already exists between North Korea and uh, the West, and South Korea included. Uh, you can deter it as a nation either by given a signal that you would reliably intercept all the missiles and it's useless for North Korea to strike, or by mutually assured destruction by massive countervailing strike. And you never can prove to, the North Korea, uh, to yourself even that uh, if the counter, uh, uh, counter military strike will be undertaken by either South Koreans or by Americans, that you really destroyed all nuclear devices. Let's remember that there are very primitive tunnels under the border between North Korea and South Korea, and North Korean soldiers could even by hands bring a primitive nuclear device into these tunnels and explode it not so far from Seoul, which means that until uh, North Koreans uh, have at their disposal at least one last remaining nuclear device, uh, the world is not safe, and you never know whether you could uh, disarm North Korea by any kind of conventional strike or even nuclear strike. This is why uh, for such a situation, the only outcome is negotiations, because this deterrence is needed for a regime exactly to assure that uh, it will not be any violent overthrowing of the regime until they possess nuclear weapons. And let me wrap up by saying again that we cannot demand at the same time that North Koreans give up their nuclear weapons and uh, give up their regime. 
uh, we, by this, demotivating them from giving up nuclear weapons uh, by saying that even if you give up nuclear weapons, we will destroy your regime, we are sending the wrong signal. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nikitin. Uh, I wrote down, among the many thoughtful things you said, the world is not safe if North Korea has even one nuclear weapon, and I think that uh, is something that we would all agree with. Um, I'm also a firm believer in the essential importance of negotiations. I myself am a veteran of successful negotiations between the U.S. and the DPRK in 1994 in the form of the agreed framework. But we all have to come uh, clearly to terms with the uh, recognition that since 2008, when North Korea walked out of the six-party talks, it has categorically refused to negotiate. And I think the overall strategy of maximum pressure, which is a variant on the uh, Obama administration's uh, strategy, aims at creating an environment in which uh, Kim Jong-un, although negotiating a rollback and an end to his nuclear program, may be the last thing on earth that he wants to do, because of sanctions and because of a unified front, is compelled to do that very thing uh, to negotiate in order to maintain uh, regime continuity. But as many speakers have pointed out, uh, we're still not there yet. And what is going to matter will be the consensus that can be reached among uh, these UN Security Council members about the next turn of the crank, so to speak, uh, in the pressure campaign. Well, with that, I'd like to open the floor to questions for the distinguished panel. Uh, and uh, if you can signal your interest, uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, the speaker. Uh, so, the gentleman straight ahead with a uh, pink tie and his hand raised, please. Yep. Please introduce yourself. Let it be a question and make it short. I am General P.K. Singh, Director of the United Service Institution of India. Uh, for me, it's a deja vu of seeing this discussion over exactly what happened in India's neighborhood, um, keeping eyes closed when proliferation takes place, then talking of securing the nuclear weapon, then talking of et cetera, et cetera. So same things happen, and having a diverse uh, view on nuclearization. My specific question is, uh, we see already, uh, even in this panel here, uh, a view that they should, North Korea will remain nuclearized, it will have its weapons, and we must talk to it. Is it time for the Republic of Korea and Japan also to consider going nuclear? Well, you can carry on having your talks. You can carry on having it. Will you carry on with that American nuclear umbrella, or will you also look around at having your own nuclear weapons? So my specific question is to the ministers from the uh, Republic of Korea and from Japan. Um, I think I led the answer to your question in my answer to the previous question raised by Danny. Uh, once again, the Korean government is fully committed to the principle of uh, the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And we are not entertaining the idea of uh, going nuclear at this point in time. But having said that, uh, what is more important right now is to add the pressure and to introduce new sanctions upon the regime in Pyongyang so that uh, we do everything we can right now under the uh, existing international system uh, with a view to bringing about the change in the strategic calculation of the leadership in Pyongyang. That's the path we are taking, and we will stick to that path. Thank you. Dr. Morimondo, anything that you would care to add to the question of going nuclear? Well, I understand that uh, some uh, specialists in the United States are discussing a decoupling, a decoupling uh, debate. But uh, Japan has absolutely no intention and plan, idea uh, to change a nuclear policy. We believe uh, that the extended data is credible and workable. Uh, 
mainly due to the still we have a very strong nuclear allergy among the people. The most of the people never, never support the nuclear option at all. Even if we have some nuclear threat from neighboring country, uh, absolutely not. The second is that uh, our priority is maintain uh, NPT and IAEA system. If we, we, we change nuclear policy, uh, the nuclear supply, nuclear material, material supply will be stopped. Uh, we, we cannot survive uh, without any uh, nuclear energy, uh, which are uh, coming from uh, another country. So uh, in, in terms of uh, national security, uh, energy policy, and uh, uh, sentiment among the people, absolutely we have no nuclear option at all. That so in a nutshell, the problem is a proliferation of nuclear weapons, uh, not a not an insufficiency, and therefore uh, the solution is to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula, not to nuclearize uh, Northeast Asia. So uh, let me call on the gentleman uh, whose microphone is blinking right now. Okay. Uh, I'm Yong Su Pan, a professor of Korea National Defense University. I have a question to uh, Jia Qingguo and uh, Alexander, Dr. Alexander Nikitin. And your, uh, in your, your presidents mentioned uh, the necessity of a, a dual suspension uh, approach to North Korea in Moscow uh, bilateral summit in early July or late June. And after that, uh, events overtaken uh, North Korea's nuclear test and ICBM test. So that uh, policy proposal is obsolete. Uh, now I think it's time for Russia and China as a responsible nuclear weapon states of MPT to have to take measures to protect and maintain and strengthen MPT regime. So you need to take dual suspension policy on your part, China and Russia should take suspension of provision of a positive security assurance and negative security assurance that can be entitled to MBT uh, norm countries. And also suspension of food and oil aid to North Korea. That's a signal to North Korea North Korean leader that unless they uh, comply with the MPT norms, there, there is no chance for them to survive. So you give, you have to take dual suspension policy on your own. What is your response okay. to my question? So it's not a question if it's phrased you have to, <laughs> but uh, I understand where you're going with this, namely if North Korea's latest nuclear test and its ICBM launches effectively render the idea of a, of a twin uh, freeze uh, obsolete, then what's next? What is the Chinese government, what is the Russian government willing to suspend uh, in order to get North Korea to come into line with the Security Council resolutions that you endorsed uh, the NPT that you support? Would you suspend food aid? Would you f support oil supplies? Would you suspend security assurances? Uh, so why don't we begin with Professor Jia and then uh, Dr. Nikita. Well, thank you for your question. I think certainly uh, North Korea's recent uh, test uh, made uh, suspension uh, not possible, uh, especially on the, on the part of North Korea. Okay. And also made suspension of military exercises on the part of South Korea and the US uh, unlikely. Okay. Um, but I think uh, what Chinese government wants now is that we should not react in an emotional way. Uh, we should react in a calculated 
and rational way. Uh, China certainly uh, has a great stake uh, as well as a strong supporter of the NPT. And China will work with other countries to impose uh, sanctions as well as adopting other measures to put pressures on North Korea and to try to persuade North Korea to change its policy. It's a dangerous policy. Uh, and it's to a lot of people, and I think uh, a lot of Chinese agree, it's a suicidal policy for North Korea. So uh, certainly China would work with other countries as to how to, how to put the, uh, you know, what kind of med adequate measures uh, we should uh, adopt further. And China uh, probably would favor tougher, around, uh, tougher sanctions in the next round of sanctions. Uh, with regard to whether, you know, China would cut off oil altogether or food supply, and, uh, these are the decisions that the, gov the Chinese government has to make. Uh, but uh, I don't know whether it will be cut off completely, but I believe the Chinese government would work with other countries to impose another round of severe sanctions on North Korea. Thank you. Dr. Nikitin, what would uh, Russia consider suspending? Uh, first of all, let me stress that Russia and China not the first time stay on very close or same positions in the international security area. For example, let me remind uh, the joint Russian-Chinese proposals against militarization of space or joint Russian-Chinese proposals regarding extension of INF treaty uh, to the third parties. Uh, and here again, uh, in general, positions of Russia and China are very close to positions of the Western countries. I mean, our ultimate goal is the same as yours. We want uh, no nuclear uh, North Korea, and we want uh, stability in the Korean Peninsula. But our tactics might differ. And uh, let me remind you that it was USSR who helped China to develop nuclear weapons. And then, at different historic period, China a little bit helped to Pakistan to develop nuclear weapons. And maybe, we don't know details, but maybe Pakistan helped to North Korea to develop nuclear weapons. This change should be stopped. And in fact, uh, now sanctions are used uh, by international community to try to bring North Korea towards negotiations table. But uh, Russia's position is this. We only support sanctions which went through the Security Council of the United Nations. We are against any unilateral sanctions of any governments which are imposed on the top of the sanctions which are coordinated by the international community. Why? Because, in fact, by sanctions, theoretically, you make uh, Korean, domestic Korean audience to uh, the populist population of North Korea to press their leader to sit at the negotiations table. But this, is a, well, this approach does not work. Uh, sanctions, uh, limitation of food supply, limitation of fuel supply to North Korea is not a method to bring Korean leader to the negotiations table. What is the method? The method is carrot. I mean, when we have stick and carrot, sanctions are stick. But we need carrot. We need to promise something to the North Korean regime to bring it to negotiations table. We need to give positive signals. We need to give signals that after negotiations, uh, stabilization for North Korea would be obtained, and North Korean nation as well as North Korean leadership would be able uh, to survive uh, even if they give up nuclear weapons. This is why, let me stress again, our position is we want the same goal, only through different tactics. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Nikitin, and, and uh, those are important points. Uh, I will say that having uh, negotiated with the North Koreans and having worked on uh, North Korea related issues for the bulk of my professional career, I've come to the conclusion that North Koreans don't eat carrots. They think carrots are always poisoned. Uh, that said, I know that from uh, the United States government's perspective, and this is as true uh, for the Trump administration as it was for the Obama or the Bush administration, the commitments that were made 
uh, in the six party talks uh, that are enshrined in the September 2005 uh, joint statement. Uh, commitments based on North Korea's own commitment to achieve the goal of denuclearization. Those commitments uh, stand and the U.S. would be ready in principle to uh, work together with our uh, partners on a successor regime to an armistice work uh, to negotiate uh, diplomatic normalization work to provide economic and development assistance. All of these things that were put on the table are still there. Uh, I don't believe that North Korea uh, wants or believes in those promises. I think North Korea is operating on the premise that it can obtain all of this uh, through blackmail uh, instead of making compromises and it falls to us to disprove that. Now the uh, time to wrap up is uh, on us, but I'll use my prerogative to say one last thing. I honestly believe that as formidable as the U.S. military and the U.S. ROK and U.S. Japan alliances are, as tremendous as our technological advantage and our lead is, the greatest strength that uh, the international community musters in dealing with the threat from Kim Jong-un is unity, is our common objective to enforcing and enhancing international law. And the value of this conference and the value of this panel in airing the thinking and allowing for the exploration of ideas and options uh, because it promotes solidarity and unity and underscores the degree to which uh, Kim Jong-un is really the outlier, uh, I think is very significant and I want to end uh, by thanking the Seoul Defense Dialogue and the Ministry of National Defense uh, for this great work and thanking our esteemed panelists for your time and your contributions. Thank you.